Please remain standing as we read God's Word together. Today's sermon text comes from Mark chapter 14, verses 43 through 65. Mark chapter 14, verses 43 through 65. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity that we may obtain what you promise in the power of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, reminds us that Jesus is the great high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses because he was tempted in every respect and was without sin. Mark chapter 14 reminds us that Jesus was the victim of lies, innuendo, frame-ups, and a crooked trial conducted by the credentialed thought leaders of the day. This means that Jesus can even sympathize with you when you are the victim of the rigged system of the credentialed thought leaders of our day. Jesus is fully aware of and prepared for what is coming as Judas leads the guards to arrest him. The crowd arrives and Judas directs them to Jesus with a kiss. Peter cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. But Jesus tells everyone there's no need for all the drama. They could have arrested Jesus any day in the temple if they'd not been afraid of the people's reaction. But let the scriptures be fulfilled, it says in verse 49. In other words, all this has taken its place in the plan and purpose of God. The disciples flee, as does a young man who loses his cloak in the fracas. In verse 53, the scene transitions from Gethsemane to the high priest's house. The religious leaders come together to hear testimony against Jesus. What do they charge him with? Well, they charge him with two things. First, Jesus threatened to replace the temple in verse 58. And second, Jesus committed blasphemy in verse 64. The blasphemy charge is connected to Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. But it's a sham trial. 
Back in Mark chapter 14, verse 1, we are told they had already determined to kill him. The trial proceedings are designed to bring about a capital charge, even if the witnesses contradict themselves. Perhaps this is why Jesus remained silent throughout much of the night, as it says in verse 61, reminding us of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now Jesus eventually breaks his silence, but only after he's prompted a second time. When Jesus speaks, he reveals that he is the Messiah. Ceremonially, the high priest tears his robes in verse 63, which is the sign of hearing blasphemy. Death is the sentence, though they must wait on the Roman authorities to make it official. In verse 65, the cruel and cowardly mockings and beatings begin. Who is responsible for Jesus' death? Is it Judas? Is it the religious leaders? Or is it Pilate? Well, Judas is guilty, as we saw several weeks ago, and his guilt embodies the turncoat guilt of all those baptized and raised in the church who betray their master. Pilate, as we will see in Mark chapter 15, is also guilty, and his guilt embodies the universal guilt of an idolatrous state. And in this passage today, we see that the religious leaders are guilty, and their guilt embodies the religious self-righteousness that has been a blight on the world since ancient times. Now, the temptation with this passage is to pull out our pointy finger, sharpen it up, and say, you're guilty, you're guilty, and you're guilty. Failing to realize that ultimately it is our sin that puts Jesus on the cross. Yet in Mark chapter 14, as you appraise the many guilty parties, you should realize how easily anyone can become a crafty religious leader, or a devious disciple, a lying witness, or a cowardly Peter, a blown and tossed governor, or a mindless member of a hate-filled mob, a harsh soldier, or a fearful disciple running away. The key to guarding yourself against becoming like these is to focus your attention on Jesus Christ. The many characters of Mark chapter 14 come and go, but keep your attention on Jesus Christ, on who He is and what He does. And in particular, notice three things about Christ in this passage. First, notice that Christ defends your honor. Christ defends your honor. As it relates to the incident with Peter cutting off the guard's ear and Jesus healing the man's ear, as recorded in John chapter 18, and then Jesus telling Peter to put away the sword, this shows us that we do not defend Jesus Christ with violence. Christianity is not an honor religion like Islam is. And in this way, there is a distinction between Christianity and Islam. And not just a distinction in historical tradition and theology, which of course there are many significant distinctions. But there is also a distinction between Christianity and Islam in the fact that Islam is an honor religion and Christianity is not. Muslims believe it is part of their sacred duty and devotion to defend the moral honor of the prophet Muhammad. That is the reason why when Western media or Western artists or movies are derogatory or insulting towards Islam or the Quran or Muhammad, they sometimes respond with violence. Why? Because in their minds they are defending the honor of their religion. 
In contrast, Christianity does not do this. When Peter uses a sword to cut off the man's ear, Jesus tells Peter in Matthew chapter 26, verse 52, put your sword back in its place. Jesus' words in Mark chapter 14, verses 48 and 49, mean that they all should have realized that he's not going to offer violent resistance. Jesus here forbids the transformation of Christianity into something we defend with the sword. Why does Jesus forbid the disciples from fighting for him and stopping the arrest? Well, there's two reasons, which really are the same reason. The first reason, Jesus says in Mark chapter 14, verse 21, the Son of Man goes as it is written. In other words, Jesus must be arrested. He must be tried by a kangaroo court, and he must die on a cross, and then he must be raised from the dead. All of this is happening as it is written. And this leads to the second reason Jesus forbids the disciples from fighting for him and stopping his arrest. Because Jesus turns our dishonor into honor. In this trial, in this arrest, in this crucifixion, Jesus is turning your dishonor into honor. He turns your guilt and your unworthiness into righteousness and forgiveness. And so we don't defend His honor. He defends our honor. Just like we don't wash His feet, but He washes our feet, so too. We don't defend His honor. He, in this moment, is defending our honor. Jesus dies on a cross where He will bear our dishonor, where He will bear our shame. He is not afraid of dishonor in terms of taking on the guilt of the sin of His people. Jesus is despised and rejected by men. In the resurrection, when the Father raises Jesus Christ bodily and physically from the grave, Jesus is vindicated. And He is vindicated further in His elevation, in His ascension, in the fact that He's now seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Philippians chapter 2, reflecting on the ministry of Jesus, says that Christ emptied Himself of heavenly honor in order to come to earth and save us through His death through His dishonor. A substitutionary atonement in which He bore our dishonor and was willing on the cross to forfeit His honor in obedience to the Father and out of love for you. In this way, by faith in Christ, you are saved from the guilt of the punishment of the sins that have earned you wrath. And you are made new creatures in Christ designed to live in the new heavens and the new earth. And so what does all this mean for the Christian life now? Well, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 22, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. And so, blessed are you when people hate you and dishonor you. It's not your job to defend Christ's honor. It's your job as Christians to preach Christ crucified, raised from the dead, our Savior and Lord, and to live out this resurrection truth day by day. While this will invite dishonor from the world, remember that Christ takes all of that dishonorment Christ takes all of that revilement and all of that hate onto His shoulders and sets you free. And so, what does Jesus do for you? Well, first, Jesus Christ defends your honor. Second thing we see in this passage is Jesus Christ vindicates your message. I'm talking to the church now. Jesus Christ vindicates your message, the message of the gospel that belongs to the church. So picking up now in verse 61. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? 
And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So the high priest asks him if he's the, the Messiah. And Jesus' response le- uh, links him to the glorified Son of Man figure from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. The coming with the clouds of heaven language is also based on Daniel chapter 7. This, as we saw back in Mark chapter 13, refers to the coming destruction of the temple, which occurs in A.D. 70. The seated at the right hand of power language is based on Psalm 110 verse 1. We also preached a sermon on that passage not long ago. And so we see the high priest asks him, are you the Messiah? And Jesus responds, and he quotes scripture, and he points out that the Lord is both sitting and coming. You will see him seated, and you will see him coming. Now, how can that be? Well, the idea is that the actions of Christ, first in destroying the temple and judging Israel in his coming, and second in ruling at God's right hand while he is seated, are both expressions of Jesus' sovereign authority. And so what Jesus does in his coming and what Jesus does while he is sitting both express Jesus' sovereign authority. The one who comes before God in the clouds of heaven is given dominion and glory and kingship that is universal and unending. In other words, Jesus' words in verse 62, based on Daniel 7 and Psalm 110, are enthronement oracles, establishing Jesus' dominion across the face of the earth. And so the the high priest asks Jesus, are you the Messiah? And Jesus responds by preaching the gospel message, the message of his sovereign authority and the expansion of that authority across the face of the earth. These are enthronement oracles. But don't forget what's going on when Jesus says this. Jesus is standing before the high priest who is charging him with capital crimes. Jesus here pronounces his universal dominion in a moment when he has no leverage. He seems powerless, brought before a court organized by the principles of injustice. And here, With no trace of human power left, he speaks plainly about who he is. It must be this way. The great I am possesses a power utterly different from the high priest or the scribes or Pontius Pilate. Jesus' authority is not like human authority. Jesus' authority looks like this. The high priest has him in cuffs ready to go to his death sentence. And Jesus says, I have the full sovereign authority of God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Jesus' authority is not like human authority because in his death, in his pain and shame, in his sufferings, in his beatings and mockings, Jesus is in those acts making his enemy a footstool for his This is Jesus' gospel message to the high priest, and this is your message. His message is your message. So Jesus isn't only vindicating his message, he's vindicating your message. And what is that message? The Savior of the world was born in an obscure village as the child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 years old. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held high office. He never had a family. He never owned a home. He never went to college. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He didn't have the credentials of the religious thought leaders of the day. 
He is 33 years old when the teeth of a corrupt system turn against him. His friends run away. He is nailed to a cross between two thieves. When he is dead, he is laid in a borrowed grave. And in these deeds, the Son of God came to earth in the form of a man and purchased salvation for his people, turning death to life through the power of his resurrection. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus Christ stands as the central figure of the human race. Of all the armies that have ever marched, of all the navies that have ever sailed, of all the parliaments that have ever sat, of all the kings that have ever reigned, put together, they have not affected life on earth, as has this one solitary carpenter from Nazareth. And without any trace of glory or power, Jesus tells the high priest, yes, I am the Christ. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is the vindication of your message, such that if you find yourself emptied of influence and power in the face of a skeptical high priest, you know that your king is seated at the right hand of power, establishing a kingdom that is universal and unending. And so, what does Jesus do for you? Well, first, Jesus defends your honor. And second, Jesus vindicates your message. And third, Jesus Christ clothes you with glory robes. Jesus Christ clothes you with glory robes. There's been a tremendous amount of discussion about who this young man from verses 51 and 52 is. Mark doesn't say, and so we can't be dogmatic about it. One good guess is that it's Mark himself. But whoever it is, searching out the person's identity distracts from the main point. Notice that as unprepared as the disciples are for arrest, this young man is even more unprepared for arrest, trial, and death. He flees without his linen cloth. He flees without his white robe. In Scripture, what's the significance of the white robe? Well, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 11, the martyrs are each given a white robe. In other words, this young man in Mark chapter 14 flees without his martyr's robe. He flees naked, and nakedness equals shame. But this isn't the end of the story of the white robe. I want you to track the presence of the linen cloth throughout the rest of Mark. So if you've got your Bibles open in front of you, I want you to follow along here and see this. If you don't, that's fine. You can listen carefully. But I want you to follow the presence of the white cloth, the linen cloth. So picking up Mark chapter 14, verse 51. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away. So notice the double use of linen cloth, this seemingly insignificant and weird detail mentioned twice. Now jump to chapter 15, verse 46. And Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Again, notice the double use of this seemingly insignificant detail of the linen cloth. And then finally, as we track the story of the linen cloth, chapter 16, verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man. Interesting, we saw a young man, chapter 14, verse 51. Now we see a young man. So entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Do you see the story of the linen cloth? Both a young man and a linen cloth return later in Mark's gospel. 
Joseph of Arimathea covers the body of Jesus with a linen cloth in chapter 15. When the women get to the tomb, they find not an angel, but a young man sitting at the right side, dressed in a white robe. The young man who disappeared into the night, naked, without his linen cloth, is now clothed at the right hand of privilege, telling the women to give the message to the disciples that the risen Christ is not in the grave. He has moved on. Mark is showing us this. When the young man cannot imagine dying a martyr's death, he runs away in fear, exposed and ashamed and naked. Yet, despite having fled into the garden, he is reunited with Jesus on the other side of death. He is given another chance to receive the glory of martyrdom. Likewise for you. You must learn the lesson of the linen cloth. After the linen cloth is put on Christ in the tomb, it is put on you when you live by faith in the veracity of the resurrection. Let's close by praying together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, criminal in the eyes of men, Savior to the world. He has forgiven our iniquities, healed our diseases, and redeemed our lives from destruction. Uphold us by the power of the Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.